electronics for space and aerospace, the primary goal is to build reliable product. So an aerospace customer or satellite customer is going to expect M electronics to last 15 to 20 years with zero failure. So a lot of my time would be spent working with aerospace and satellite customers on designing basically high, re high reliability into the product itself. So that would be the prime aim of them electronics is longevity and zero failure. To improve reliability on PCBs, you'd really need to start the PCB fabrication and design itself. So obviously the first thing the designer needs to design the board to be reliable. So they're not going to use bleeding edge technology. They're going to use standard technologies that we know are proven, reliable, are not going to fail. The second thing is you need to have a PCB facility that you know each process is standardized, it's repeatable, and you have to have the process controls and measurements in that process to ensure that your repeatability is 100% all the time. Um, so a lot of our customers would basically come and ask for data from our processes. Um, a lot of satellite customers will ask for DPA type analysis, basically destroying boards through production to prove you've got the right plating thicknesses, et cetera, as well. And all the way down to SPC process control analysis for all your different processes. So it's, it's not just one thing, it's a whole, the design has to be designed to be reliable and the fabricator needs to be set up to build it to have reliable processes as well. So for the Ross initiative in aerospace and defense, it's never going to apply. Aerospace probably is never going to move away from um, leaded hassle um, because uh, the risk is really too high. The risk of moving a different surface finish, moving a different SMT, increased temperatures as well, is really adding additional uh, potential risk to aerospace product. So <clears throat> uh, I deal with uh, most of the aerospace customers on a, on a regular basis and there is absolutely nothing on the horizon to look at having a Ross type initiative with an aerospace. So it'll always be it's hassle. Really it's all hassle. Standard leaded process. Yep. To be used. Yeah. No, we, we can use different surface finish. We could use Enig or, um, but on the assembly process, they're using leaded, leaded um, materials. So basically for uh, the environment product has to go into, obviously there's gonna be a whole set of different testing requirements. So a lot of our satellite um, customers, they have their own vacuum chambers and within them vacuum chambers are actually temperature cycling the product itself. They have to mimic basically zero gravity in a vacuum and they basically need to go from minus, um, probably minus 50 to plus 125. Because depending if it's a low orbit satellite or it's a geostationary, depends on the type of environment it's going into. And even on the airspace side, if you imagine an engine controller uh, on an aircraft, and one of them is based up in Alaska, and a similar aircraft based in a desert in the Middle East. Right. Now you can see the massive temperature changes as well. And then if the aircraft's moving from one of the environments to another, it's constantly seeing. And, and you know when an aircraft gets up um, to 10,000 feet, it's, it's sitting at minus 50. So any exposed electronics has to be able to withstand that temperature and obviously elevated temperature when it lands on a ground. And it has to cycle through these temperature on a daily basis, multiple times per day. So. So really, when you're dealing with that type of customer, they'll have a whole set of um, testing loops that you need to jump through to prove, one, the design is reliable, but two, it can be manufactured to be reliable in them types of environment. Well, most space applications um, are using very heavy copper. Very so, heavy copper. So, um, anything with any power requirements is using much heavier than two ounce copper. I see a lot of designs with uh, up to five ounce copper 
I see uh, some 20 layer product with 20 layers of four ounce copper. So how they manage heat in space is basically through um, dissipation. So they use very, very, very heavy copper designs. Um, they're also doing uh, a lot of thermal vias. They're using the chassis to dissipate heat as well. So, because uh, remember, they don't, <laughs> energy on a satellite is key. You can't have fan cooled systems or, so they're basically using the natural properties of the copper itself, basically as part of their uh, heating strategies as well. So, but yeah, it's, uh, it, it's a challenge. And as you know, building very heavy copper boards is a challenge as well. Plus, it's going to be in a material like a polyamide, which is a much more difficult resin system to work with. So it brings its own challenges to meet, to meet the requirements as well. Is polyamide a favorite material yeah. for aerospace? Yeah, polyamide's probably 95% of applications. It depends on the satellite. If it's a 15 to 20 year geostationary satellite, it's going to be polyamide. Some of the lower orbit um, satellites that maybe are only useful for two to three years, yeah, they can use other materials. But people like Rogers are moving into uh, producing materials that are now becoming attractive to the guys that are doing the space application. It's basically like um, an enhanced class three. Um, so basically your uh, release requirements, your quality requirements, uh, minimum plating, et cetera, has basically all been elevated within them specifications. But what I find is a lot of satellite customers, their own specifications are above and beyond even what class 3A would be as well. Um, they're very stringent on uh, design rules, they're very stringent on process control and release and DPA. Um, normally, you might do 100% uh, microsectioning for class 3. Uh, some of these satellite guys are at 200% microsections because they just want to make sure everything is exactly built to the way they want it to be. Paperwork is uh, huge as well. So the amount of QC, testing, uh, reporting, uh, microsection analysis, um, uh, fares um, is a lot much, much stricter than, for instance, just an aerospace, which is a pretty stringent product as well. But satellite just takes it to one more level. So it's uh, paperwork's pretty key to all the satellite people. It depends where it will be in the aircraft. So something like the JetWave program, uh, which is basically um, uh, Wi-Fi on aircraft, that's actually outside the fuselage. That sits on a on a cap sitting on top of the fuselage itself. So that's in an exposed environment. Engine is an exposed environment. So really the only electronics that are internal would be your entertainment systems, all the galley lighting systems, um, and also the cockpit's a controlled environment as well. So, so all the electronics we build, we actually don't have a differentiator between internal and external fuselage. The electronics would be built exactly the same. Now how they're encapsulated and controlled is much different as well, so yes. Um, uh, not as much as, um, for instance, satellite um, is concerned about it, but um, the, the big challenge would be if you had a lightning strike, so there's uh, a lot of redundancy built into aircraft. Uh, so typically you'll have more than one system that basically you can switch over to. And the way the aerospace works is they're not ever both supplied from the same supplier. So if there was ever a defect, you don't want to run the risk of having the same defect on the backup system. So there's a lot of redundancy built within the aircraft. That, so maybe like one of two or two out of three logic or something. Yes, yeah, exactly right. So it's, um, so yeah, there's, uh, you know, engines go down, aircraft can still fly one engine and same in the electronics. If one board goes down, there's typically on the critical systems, there'll be a backup for that system as well. So. We may be close to people going into space, but I think they'll only be there for Maybe 30 minutes, 30 minutes or an hour. It's more of a up and low orbit and back down, so. Um, but 
the electronics on, for instance, the space station and stuff. Yeah, that's that's a much different animal to to deal with as well. So, even the um, electronics we send out to uh, Mars, like the Mars rover, um, uh, there's a new huge satellite being built by Northrop Grumman going out. That's actually going out to a million miles away, which will be a hundred times more powerful than Hubble. So there's, you know, it's. Uh, the planning is intense, so, and they run through multiple, multiple scenarios on releasing these products in the space, so it's, it's pretty key. Big challenge is getting electronics from the ground to space, that's the big challenge. Once it's in space, if it's working, things are good, so. But there's a new, men there's a new mentality to move space satellites to modular. So they send up little mini robots and in five years they'll be able to launch just the module and what will happen is the robot can go pick the module up and then swap out modules and then update the capability of the satellite because if you look at the satellite usage there's no space left to put any more satellites up. So all the little windows are all full. So what they're now looking at is putting two satellites in per window. But the big challenge is power supply. Because you need power supply to keep it geostationary. I mean, if you're one close to it, you don't want the two satellites crashing in each other. So the thinking is, in future satellites, if you had replaceable power supplies, you'd extend the life of that satellite to 20, 30 years. And if you could replace the electronics, you've now expand, extended the uh, the technology within the satellite at the same time. So there's thoughts about how they're actually going to adopt this into the satellite business. They use different types of power supply. So, um, so they're using liquid. Um, some of it's solar, some of it's um, uh, chemical, and the others is batteries as well. So there's there's different ones. The problem with the thrusters, it typically needs to be a chemical type reaction. Now the thrusters only will, will just you know burn for a couple of seconds just to keep the satellite in position. Uh, more of the power within the electronics themselves is basically solar and battery. So basically it's using solar to capture energy, recharge batteries and then basically it can run off battery. But the other problem is once the the chemical power supply or source exhausts itself you've now nothing to reposition your satellite. So that's the part that, because the, the solar part of it, it just can keep re-energizing itself forever. But the chemical part for the thrusters, thrusters, et cetera, that's the part they need to try and replace, because that typically is going to exhaust itself in 10 to 15 years. So even though it only uses a very, very small amount of energy, but it's, it'll deplete eventually. The projected, growth for aircraft is the number of aircraft globally will double in the next 20 years. So, and that just doesn't mean aircraft. Uh, obviously there's a huge growth in Asia. Uh, China's uh, demand is going to be massive. But that also is for simulators, for pilots. So the whole industry needs, they're talking about 900,000 pilots over the next 20 years. And then in 20 years, you have all the pilots retiring, so there's just going to be a constant need for pilots. Then you need simulators to train them, and they obviously need aircraft to put them on. So, so the amount of passenger transport's going to, or the number of aircraft's going to double over the next 20 years.